Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Owen Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of the International AIDS Society. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our unsung heroes, the people who work behind the scenes to make sure that the evidence presented at this meeting moves forward through time and across the world. Those are our rapporteurs. So I'd like you to give a big round of applause up front for our rapporteurs. I'm not going to take any more of their time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Liddy Trotman, Track A Lead Rapporteur. Dr. Trotman is Chief of the Cellular Immunology Section at the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the U.S. Military HIV Research Program at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. As a trained human immunologist, she studies the cellular immune response in acute HIV infection, HIV remission, and HIV vaccine trials. Please again welcome Dr. Trotman. Thank you. I would like to thank the organizers for this honor. And also, I would start by thanking my rapporteurs for track A, uh, Tomake Mamoudi, Afa Mokoy, Julie Mitchell, and Jody, Jory Simon. They did an, an amazing job at covering the 62 talks that we had in track A and summarizing it every day. So what I'm going to do today is just give you some of the themes that were covered in those sessions and, and just uh, illustrate them by, by some um, examples. So to prevent HIV infection, a couple of talks discussed the different ways to, to block the, the virus to enter the gut mucosa. This, was, this can be done by small molecules or by um, different means of changing the, micro, the microbiome environment. And in the research community, many efforts for a long time has been done to develop an HIV vaccine to block HIV transmission. And I will have a talk about that a little bit later. Um, when virus is entering the mucosa and, and cross the barrier, a couple of talks also addressed the characteristic of the virus and, and its dynamic upon transmission. So a couple of talks again presented how we can prevent HIV infection, developing new tools, and these include uh, small molecules uh, like nanoparticles to, to enhance the uh, neutralizing antibody titers, also new ways of administrating a virus at the mucosa, and these are really based on new technologies that are developed every day. And this is an example of a small molecule that you can see here that was developed, sorry, as, as it's going forward. Okay. Uh, this small molecule that was developed as a CD4 mimicry, uh, which binds to the GP120 of the envelope of the HIV, and that blocks the HIV to enter the target cells. And you can see here in the red curve are the monkeys that receive this CD4 mimetic um, molecule uh, with a vaccine that they were able to protect, to get protected against different HIV challenge better than the other monkeys in, in the other group. So this is to give you an example of the new tools that are in the prospect to, to prevent HIV infection. So another very, very good tool uh, to block HIV infection are broadly neutralizing antibodies. These antibodies, I'm sure you will hear a lot more about them, are really good at uh, recognizing different viruses and neutralize them really well. So in the development of those neutralizing antibodies, the, the immunogen that were used before were not really, really good. And so now we have new tools and new development of antigens, like the SOSIP GB140 here, that is just uh, the, 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 up, the outside part of the HIV envelope, and it's the same 3D structure. So when we immunize with this protein, we can really um, generate a better immune response. And this is illustrated here. You can see that rabbits that have been immunized with an uncleaved uh, envelope generate low levels of antibodies. And when the rabbits are immunized in blue with these SOSIP trimers, they get generated a lot higher titers of neutralizing antibodies. So these, these tools are, are really important both for prevention and uh, for, for treatment. And a lot of talks have addressed these uh, neutralizing antibody, their generation, their uh, engineering also, and, and, and uh, enhancing capacity. So as a more advanced stage of development in the vaccine field, an important study was, um, was presented in the APPROACH trial. And this is the, the results that are presented here. So the APPROACH trial was uh, the, the administration of an A26-A26 GP140 vaccine regimen uh, that the um, 
the human uh, gods, and it was also given at the same at the same time uh, monkeys. And these monkeys were challenged, and you can see that at this stage, when the monkey were challenged, the vaccine gave 67 uh, percent of protection. So this vaccine was followed uh, amongst the, the vaccination, and then. The important data is that this vaccine, the response to this vaccine persisted for at least one year after the last boost of the vaccine. And you can see the last boost by the little uh, letter B here. So the RB144 trial had shown us that uh, the rapid decay of protection was due to a loss of antibodies. So I think this, um, these data are very important, showing you that these responses retain for a long time and also are even higher than the responses obtained in monkeys that were challenged and were protected. So this is, I think, very important, and it's even more important as, as we speak. Um, the large uh, clinical trial HVTN705 in Bokodo trial is, is starting and rolling, and we will have uh, th those results in a few years. So what do we do with people that already have HIV, and how can we induce an HIV remission? As we know that we are st working on, on very good vaccines, what can we do to, to uh, induce an HIV remission? I stole this slide from the uh, terrific talk that Dr. Jones uh, gave on the plenary on Wednesday, uh, where he, he had a very good metaphor on, on the HIV remission. So if you think about the HIV reservoir as the little viruses here in the water be, be, beyond the dam, and the little uh, Dutch boy uh, here as the ARVs trying to keep the virus or the water to get out. How can we intervene on, on, that, on that virus? Well, the first thing is that we can train, drain the reservoir, which, which is equivalent to eliminating HIV-infected cells. And the other thing we can do is try to reinforce that dam, and, and we can do that by boosting the immune responses to HIV. And we can even do, try to do both. So a lot of talks presented during this conference really try to, to develop new strategies to eliminate the viral reservoir and prevent it to rebounding. But before developing these strategies, we need to understand how the virus is persisting. And if you can see the number of talks that I have listed here in the bottom of the slides, that represents the number of talks that addressed this HIV persistence and the ways to, to understand how the immune control is, is fighting it. So in this, um, in this slide, this is representing the fresh cohort, an example of a fresh cohort uh, in South Africa. And this trial recruits uh, women which are uh, recruited in acute, very acute infection and immediately start treatment. As you can see here in this graph, the viral load is, is really uh, starting to, to go down very rapidly. And in that uh, cohort, data were presented showing that very early treatment can preserve immune function. But also other data in that cohort actually showed that the, after a certain period of time, the lymph node excision was done at this time, you can see on ART, HIV proteins labeled by P, um, P24 here that you can see in green were found in the lymph nodes, as you can see in that staining, uh, that, uh, that section. So showing you that the HIV reservoir is rapidly seeded and persists in tissues under ART. So those individuals, even though they will be better candidates for immune intervention because they have a, an, a preserved immune response, they still have virus persisting at pretty high level in the tissues that we have to find a way to target and to get rid of. So the virus was also analyzed and characterized um, for its dynamic under the, the, in, in the, the reservoir. And this is shown here by this beautiful phylogenetic tree uh, full of colors um, that is describing the sequences in a single individual. So you can see the sequences starting from the primary infection in red up to just before starting treatment in blue. And when the virus is outgrows during long-term art to try to mimic a treatment interruption, and we sequence the viruses that are coming out of this outgrowth virus, you can see that the pink viruses here from the outgrowth virus are more uh, uh, similar to the virus that was present just before therapy. But also some of the virus are found way f coming from way back at the beginning of the infection, but most of the virus comes from before the infection, just before therapy. So another study that was very interesting was the, to look at the post-treatment controllers. The post-treatment controllers are people that are controlling the virus after treatment interruption, 
but they're, they're different from the elite controllers or the natural controllers, as, as we call them, that have been extendedly, extensively studied in the field. These post-treatment controllers in the Visconti French cohort um, were shown to be different for the natural controllers in their immune responses. Um, and also this new study showed that these HIV uh, post-treatment controllers showed a particular genotype, so something characteristic of their genes, that gave them uh, uh, an enhanced capacity for their NK cells to control the virus. And this is illustrated here in that graph in the orange circles, where you can see that the NK cells from the post-treatment controllers are far better at controlling uh, replication in vitro in this assay compared to the NK cells from the other donors. So understanding the parameters that help this post-treatment controller to control the virus will help us design new strategies. So the main strategy that has been uh, worked a lot in the field is called the shock and kill strategy. And this uh, is, is basically to wake up the, the latent reservoir from its latent stage by a latency reversing agent and then killing the latently reversed uh, cells by many means. But another strategy has been uh, developed for a couple of years, which is called the block and lock. And this is the opposite. This uh, constitutes the, the deep, the, to induce the deep latency of the virus by a latency enhancing agent, and then lock it by epigenetic modification at the HIV promoter. And this way the virus cannot reactivate even after stimulation. So a few years ago, this block and lock was really an out of the box idea, but more talks this session at, at this conference really show that it is another strategy that is becoming mainstream. So how can we reactivate uh, HIV? We had a couple of presentations showing that actually new molecules are able to do that really well on the shock part of the shock and kill. And you can see here two examples out of three that showed uh, an enhancement of the HIV transcription uh, here in non-human primates with the um, der derivative protein SK um, agonist, GSK445A, and two studies in human, kiramidine and maraviroc, an anti-CCR5, that showed that every time the drug was given, either in, in, in monkeys or in human, you can see a blip of HIV transcription. So these are really good, and, and this to show you that we are making progress in designing new molecules or new strategies to wake up the virus. Um, we still have to make a lot of progress into the kill part of the shock and kill. And finally, I wanted to show you that some of the remission strategy we are developing are already testing in vivo. So a, a clinical trial, the RIVER trial, was presented at this conference, and it was constituted, it was a shock and kill strategy, constituted of the vorinostat as a latency reversing agent, and the chip ads 3 mva as the vaccine to boost the responses and the kill. And as you can really clearly see from this graph is that the, the people that received the vaccine regimen in blue didn't show any difference compared to the control group that only received ART in the red, showing that there was not a decrease in, in any um, reservoir measurements that were done. But these individuals didn't undergo uh, treatment interruption. Another in vivo study was shown in uh, monkeys um, using an alpha-4 beta-7 integrin antibody, which is supposed to uh, act and inhibit the, the virus and, and, and by mechanism we don't really understand. But here also you can really see that the two curves are overlapping between the red that the monkey is receiving the alpha-4 beta-7 antibody or the blue, the control group, showing that there was really not any difference. This is in contrast to a previous study that was published using exactly the same antibody. And that showed actually that the monkeys that received the alpha-4 beta-7 were controlling the varimia. So we don't understand what is the discrepancy yet, but this is really something that we can uh, discover further. And there was also uh, uh, another clinical trial presented by Tauni Fauci in, in uh, the uh, special session on Wednesday that was very inspiring, who uh, showed some results from a clinical trial using the anti-alpha-4 um, beta-7 antibody in humans, uh, vedolizumab, and didn't show uh, great responses as well. And finally, we heard some perhaps more uh, positive results from a clinical trial of using broadly neutralizing antibodies, and this still has to be uh, further looked at. So in summary, I showed you and we heard that the broadly neutralizing antibodies are really showing promising data in both HIV prevention and HIV remission. The data that were presented in the approach vaccine trial that are encouraging and data from the main trial will be available in 2021. 
Uh, the many talks in the HIV remission uh, air arena showed that the development of new molecules are really undergoing at fast pace for the development of, of strategies to reactivate or silence the latent reservoir. But so far, the remission trials, with or without art interruption, do not induce sufficient decrease of the reservoir or sustain viral control. And I would love to bring you more positive outcomes, but I would say that you don't uh, win the Tour de France at the first time you take a bike. You have to learn how to bike before. So I think in the coming years, we will see more clinical trials showing more and more uh, success in the outcomes as we learn more. And I would like to end by just saying that um, we have to involve also the community from the beginning in these trials. And I will thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Graham Mainkiss, Track B Lead Rapporteur. Professor Mainkiss is a professor of medicine and chair of poverty-related infections at the University of Cape Town. His research focuses on the clinical conditions affecting patients with advanced HIV disease, including disseminated HIV-associated tuberculosis, the tuberculosis-associated immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, and cryptococcal meningitis. Thank you. Thanks, Owen, for the introduction and good afternoon. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge uh, Margarita, Saskia, Mosapele, Casper, and Sean, the members of our rapporteur team, for their hard work for, uh, over the last four days covering all the clinical sessions. We've chosen to highlight 10 abstracts, uh, the key, key take-home messages from 10 abstracts from the clinical track in our summary. Six of these relate to the drug dolutegravir, which is appropriate as this drug moves to take center stage in treatments, treatment regimens globally. Many studies were presented evaluating its use in different strategies and specific uh, patient groups. I will also cover a pediatric study, a Kaposi sarcoma treatment trial, and two large community-based cluster randomized, randomized trials that were conducted in Africa. I start with a comparative effectiveness study that was conducted in Brazil using health systems data that evaluated the effectiveness of 3TC, tenofovir, and dolutegravir in, triple, in a triple drug regimen uh, in first line during real-world introduction in 2017, following the guideline changes in that country. The dolutegravir regimen was compared to six other first-line regimens patients received between 2014 and 2017. The analysis included 103,000 patients. After adjustment for age, sex, baseline CD4 count, viral load and adherence using dispensing data, the odds of virological suppression were 42% higher with the dolutegravir regimen compared with reference efavirenz regimen, a significant improvement. In absolute terms, this was a 7% increase in virological suppression at six months with dolutegravir compared to an efavirenz regimen, a, a similar difference to, uh, to what was observed in a single trial uh, that is now confirmed in routine clinical practice. Pedro Kahn uh, reported on the Gemini 1 and 2 clinical trials. These were identical des identically designed trials that evaluated initiating a dual therapy regimen of dolutegravir plus 3TC in ART-naive patients with HIV RNA less than 500,000 copies per mil, compared with triple drug regimen of tenofovir, FTC, and dolutegravir. The trial aimed to assess whether the dual therapy regimen was non-inferior with a 10% margin. 48-week primary endpoint results were presented at this meeting. Dual therapy was shown to be non-inferior in both trials, and what is remarkable is that, that in both arms and in both trials, 90% or more of patients achieved virological suppression to a viral load of less than 50 copies per mil at 48 weeks. There was no, tre there were, there was no treatment emergent resistance documented over one year of therapy in over 1,400 patients across these two trials, which is really remarkable uh, and shows how far we've come in first-line therapy. These trials established a role for dual therapy with dol dolutegravir and 3TC in first-line, but obviously not for certain patient groups such as those with hepatitis B co-infection or in settings where hepatitis B testing is not routine, given the important role of tenofovir in such patients. There are also questions around patients with extremely high viral loads, greater than 500,000, 
who were not included in the study. And the a number of patients with CD4 counts less than 200 in these studies was also limited and needs to be inv uh, evaluated in larger patient numbers. The Monke trial uh, done in, in several centres in France evaluated a strategy of switching patients who had suppressed, uh, suppressed viral load for over 12 months to dolutegra monotherapy. 158 patients were randomised to switch to dolutegra monotherapy or to remain on a back of a 3TC and dolutegra. At the primary endpoint assessment at week 24, monoth monotherapy was shown to be non-inferior. However, during extended follow-up uh, to week 48, seven patients in the monotherapy arm experienced virological failure and two developed treatment emergent integrase resistance mutations. This prompted the DSMB of that trial to stop the monotherapy arm and switch patients to triple therapy. And based on this and similar findings from the already published Domino trial, dolutegravir monotherapy in clinical practice should be strongly discouraged. The, the DOLPHIN trial was, uh, findings were presented in yesterday's pregnancy session. The trial evaluated virological response and dolutegravir drug concentrations in HIV-infected women presenting latent pregnancy. 60 women were randomized to receive either dolutegravir or efavirenz-based ART uh, starting in the third trimester of pregnancy. As expected, those receiving dolutegravir had more rapid virological suppression and a higher proportion, 69% versus 39%, were suppressed at the week two postpartum visit. This was despite dolutegravir concentrations being lower in the third trimester than those observed in the postpartum period in these women and, and that observed in other studies. No vertical transmissions occurred in either arm in this study. Last month, we, we heard reports from Botswana of four infants with neural tube defects born to mothers taking dolutegravir at conception. That was followed by safety communications issued by regulatory authorities. Rebecca Zash presented a detailed report of this data from the prospective Tepama study that is evaluating adverse birth outcomes across eight large maternity wards covering 45% of total births in Botswana. At the time of last month's report, 426 infants had been born to mothers on dolutegravir at conception, giving a prevalence of neural tube defects of 0.94% in this group. The denominator has since been updated and was presented, uh, as was presented at this meeting to 596 infants with no further neural tube defects identified, giving a prevalence now of 0.67%. Both are above the approximately 0.1% prevalence observed in all other groups. These other groups being women uh, conceiving on efavirenz, as well as uh, HIV-negative women. Lower bounds of the 95% confidence intervals of both estimates do not overlap with the 95% confidence intervals of those of other groups. So more data is, is required to confirm or re refute the association of taking dolutegravir at conception with neural tube def defects and uh, more data is anticipated over the next eight months. In the same session, we heard about the importance of engaging women in decision-making about dolutegravir use and effective contraception, and of considering dolutegravir's demonstrated clinical benefits in decisions, uh, and that should be emphasized. Rifampicin in standard uh, first-line TB treatment induces the metabolism of dolutegravir, lowering dolutegravir plasma con uh, concentrations. In healthy volunteers, increasing dolutegravir dosing from 50 mg daily to 50 mg twice daily has been shown to overcome this effect. But this is also needed to be demonstrated in patients with TB because disease states can alter drug metabolism. The 48-week results of inspiring, the inspiring trial were presented by Kelly Dooley. It enrolled 113 patients and evaluated dolutegravir 50 mg twice daily in ART-naive patients with active TB starting ART with an apparent regimen as control. High virological efficacy was demonstrated with similar rates of virological non-response non in both arms. The study was not powered for a formal statistical comparison. The reasons for virological non-response in the dolutegravir arm were largely due to patients discontinuing the study for non-drug-related reasons rather than having viremia at 48 weeks. No increase in adverse events or TB iris was observed with dolutegravir and drug exposures were comparable to patients with ARC TB on standard doses. These findings provide reassurance that dolutegravir can be used in TB patients at this dose and they will inform clinical guidelines. 
The living study evaluated tolerability and safety and outcomes of lipinavir ritonavir pellet formulation in 354 young children. As a background, lipinavir ritonavir tablets are difficult or impossible for young children to swallow and cannot be crushed. The syrup, the lipinavir ritonavir syrup, has its own challenges. It's, it has a bitter taste and requires a cold chain. Pellets that can be mixed with food have taste masking and are heat stable and easier for the caregiver to administer. Virological responses improved in children switched to the lipinavir ritonavir tablets with documented improvements in growth. Particularly impressive was an increase in proportion with suppressed viral load from 62 to 80 percent in those children simply switched from lipinavir ritonavir syrup to the pellet formulation. This illustrates the priority that should be given, it should be placed on investigating ART delivery strategies in children that optimize tolerability to improve outcomes. The NIH uh, sponsored A5263 trial evaluated three treatments for patients with advanced T1 Kaposi sarcoma in resource limited settings. Where chemotherapy is available for KS in these set settings, it tends to be currently bleomycin and vincristine. This trial evaluated whether bleomycin and vincristine and also whether oral letoposide were non-inferior to, to paclix, paclitaxel. The primary outcome was progression-free survival at 48 weeks. The etoposide arm was stopped early by the DSMB due to poor outcomes, and the bleomycin vincristine arm was stopped later because of low probability of demonstrating non-inferiority. Overall, overall outcomes were significantly better with paclitaxel, 20% more favorable outcomes compared with bleomycin vincristine. This trial will inform international guidelines and advocacy efforts to expand access to paclitaxel for patients with KS where it is not currently available. Finally, I will highlight two large community-based cluster randomized control trials conducted in Africa to assess whether implementation of universal test and treat or expanded test and treat guidelines coupled with community interventions would reduce new infections occurring in communities, as had been predicted by models. These trials were initiated before universal test and treat policy became policy. The Botswana Combination Prevention Project randomized 30 communities. Half received the intervention consisting of community interventions uh, and uh, expanded ART access at that time. In 2016, all communities, both in the intervention and control arm, were switched to universal ART access. The study demonstrated a 30% reduction in community HIV incidence with the intervention, illustrating that even in a setting like Botswana that had good baseline ART coverage, expanded access coupled with community interventions was able to help reduce transmission at a communi community level. The search trial conducted in East Africa had contrasting findings. In this trial, 32 communities were randomized, 16 received the intervention, which included annual testing, campaigns and the offer of rapid ART initiation in all those diagnosed positive regardless of CD4 count. The control arm communities followed national guidelines for ART access, obviously with progressive increases in CD4 threshold until universal, uh, uh, ART t in universal test and treat was implemented in 2016. There was no observed impact on HIV inter incidence uh, in this study in intervention communities, unlike the BCPP study. This uh, failure to observe an impact of the intervention could have been due to interventions received in the control communities and the changing ART guidelines in the control communities. Uh, however, significant health benefits were demonstrated. ART coverage and virological suppression increased in the intervention communities, and HIV-related death and TB diagnosis decreased significantly in the intervention communities. Finally, I would like to Thank the researchers whose studies I've highlighted and all the other presenters in the clinical track. We have had, a, had high quality science presented over the last four days and these findings will improve our care and treatment of people living with HIV globally. And also a big thank you to our hosts Amsterdam, the IAS and all of you involved in the global fight against HIV. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Asa Radix, Track C Lead Rapporteur. Dr. Radix is the Senior Director of Research and Education at the Callan Lord Community Health Center and a Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at New York University. Dr. Radix trained in internal medicine and infectious disease and has 20 years of experience providing HIV care, primary care, and hormone therapy to transgender and gender non-binary people. Please welcome Dr. Radix. So good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation to cover Track C and to present this report to you today. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of, a, a behalf of an incredibly talented, smart, and dedicated team. So thank you so much, uh, Aidan Schein, Tonya Petit, Pedro Carnero, and Michael Marco. I couldn't have done this without you. So I have just 12 minutes to summarize some very important issues and advances that occurred during the week. Um, and these are the topics I'll be covering, uh, a little on mortality trends, biomedical interventions, addressing syndemics, and key population-led interventions. So starting with uh, mortality trends in the ART era, we know that in this era of uh, antiretroviral uh, treatment, mortality due to HIV-related issues is declining. And two large studies on Tuesday highlighted the causes of mortality um, in their mostly virally suppressed patient populations. So the first study was the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, which enrolled women with HIV across British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec. Over 1,400 women were, were followed. 54 died, and the age standardized mortality was over four and a half times higher than in the general female Canadian population. Now, the primary cause of death was unknown for most women, but followed by comorbidities, which included cancer and cardiovascular disease, drug and alcohol use, and HIV-related opportunistic infections were just 6%. Um, independent predictors of mortality included hazardous alcohol use, current tobacco use, and depression. And it was interesting that HIV-related indicators, HIV-related treatment factors like um, ART use, viral load, and CD4 count were not predictive of mortality. The second study was the London Mortality Study Group. And here, likewise, it showed that 77% of deaths were due to non-AIDS conditions, and the majority of patients were on AIDS, ART and virally suppressed. Malignancies were the leading cause of death, and again, predictive risk factors were alcohol and tobacco use. I think that we need to remember that preventing premature mortality among people living with HIV urgently requires services that, that address social disparities and mental health needs, and integration of harm reduction services inclusive of tobacco and hazardous alcohol use. The results of several important HIV prevention studies were also announced at this International AIDS Conference. The first included research confirming that uh, treatment as prevention was a highly effective treatment strategy for men who have sex with men. The PARTNER2 study was designed to provide precise estimates of HIV transmission risk through condomless sex in several different gay male couples. So one couple was living with HIV and the other was HIV negative. Um, and this occurred in with the case where the person who was living with HIV was fully virally suppressed. The study enrolled uh, several different uh, gay couples in 14 countries. And as you can see here, um, 783 gay couples, a median of 1.6 years of follow-up. And the interesting thing with the study was that they were able to link transmissions um, during eligible couple years of follow-up. So the results showed that among several different gay couples who had sex over 77,000 times without condoms, with undetectable viral loads, there were no phylogenetically linked transmissions. Pretty huge. <laughs> so this was so exciting. I mean, it does indicate that the risk of HIV transmission when the HIV viral load is suppressed is effectively zero. So yes, undetectable is untransmissible. So we also received um, results from Prevenir, an ongoing observational study that provided further evidence that on-demand PrEP is an effective strategy for preventing HIV acquisition in uh, MSM at risk for HIV. So 
as you can see here, over 1,500 participants, um, uh, mostly MSM, were on PrEP. About 45% uh, used daily PrEP and 54% used on-demand PrEP. And to date, this is the interesting thing, HIV incidence in both the daily and on-demand group has been zero. And no participant <laughs> has discontinued PrEP due to drug-related adverse effects. Now, I think we should also remember, though, that despite the known efficacy of PrEP, there's still a problem getting the drug to those who need it. A session on the politics of PrEP discussed the need for political will and government-level buy-in to ensure success of programs. Um, and there are groups that just don't have access. And we heard in this session that adolescents face particular challenges to PrEP initiation due to legal barriers such as um, age of consent laws. There were several presentations related to PrEP use in the real world. Um, there are examples of massive scale-up, for example, in PEPFAR-funded uh, PrEP programs across Asian and, Pacific, uh, Asian and Pacific and African countries that increased PrEP use over 1,000% in four quarters, including significant increases among uh, female sex workers, men who have sex with men, and transgender women. The first Australian PrEP demonstration project evaluated sexual health among 115 MSM who were offered PrEP. And condom use for anal sex, yes, with, uh, with anal casual partners did decrease, but there were no new HIV infections, which is what PrEP is designed to do. We saw that PrEP was used successfully as a harm reduction tool in men at high risk for HIV who engaged in chemsex. So they were using combinations of methamphetamine and Viagra with Truvada. It's called MTV. When HIV negative um, men were engaged in intense of sex party networks added PrEP to their uh, party drug regimen, they reduced the possibility of HIV transmission. We also heard in the Netherlands that uh, it, hepatitis C prevalence um, and incidence increased uh, among HIV negative men who have sex with men who are using PrEP. So it's just a reminder that we need to be monitoring uh, hepatitis C as well as other STIs. And then research done in transgender women who are receiving hormone therapy and PrEP revealed some concerning results. And it's possible that there are ph pharmacodynamic interactions that reduce tenofovir levels in plasma, but the change was small. And we don't know if this is clinically significant. The good news is that PrEP with Truvada did not alter the estrogen levels. And I think that's been a real concern for the community. So there was a lot of uh, attention uh, to, again, to rapid and same-day um, ART initiation. We know that this is achievable in low- and middle-income settings um, when services are delivered in accessible community settings. So we had three examples, the Comlink program in East Swatini um, that included community-based testing, mobile care, and peer-based linkage. This achieved 96% ART initiation and 73% rapid initiation. Also, we saw um, implementing fast-track ART initiation in Botswana improve median time from linkage to first viral suppression from 210 down to 104 days. And in a Bangkok sexual health clinic, 79% of diagnosed patients received same-day ART and were twice as likely to be virally suppressed versus standard of care. So same-day treatment is extremely important. There was a lot of attention, too, to KP, or key population-led services. So services led by peers and KP as CBOs increased access to HIV prevention and treatment. More than half of people tested by KP CBOs in Vietnam were first-time testers, and 90% of those diagnosed uh, were enrolled in treatment. A provider explained that clients know and trust us, and that's key to success. In Malawi, healthcare provider training and differentiated service delivery modalities included peer-led outreach, um, successfully increased case finding and linkage to care among female sex workers and MSM. Um, at a Bangkok sexual health clinic employing KP staff, 79% of diagnosed patients received same-day ART and 90% were successfully referred to long-term ART care. And lastly, at the Bangkok's Tangerine Clinic, we saw that transgender women accessing hormone therapy were far more likely to repeatedly test for HIV and to access PrEP. 
You probably noticed during this uh, conference there were multiple sessions that addressed endemics, so co-occurring psychosocial conditions that interact synergistically to exacerbate the risk for HIV transmission. We know that multi-component interventions often fail to address social forces um, beyond the individual level and are often limited to one disease or condition. But syndemics offers the opportunity to recognize social and political forces that drive so structural vulnerabilities and identify inequitable distribution of power as a source of inequitable distribution of disease and can provide interventions of the policy at the policy as well as clinical and individual levels. Um, this does require systems thinking, and there may be limited experience or political will for this. So we did have some examples of, uh, on Wednesday that focused on, focused on syndemic theory and interventions. Uh, and these are just a few. We found that in India, uh, an investigation um, of the integrated biobehavioral survey showed that uh, people who, men who used alcohol, drugs, and um, and were exposed to violence, these in, interacted synergistically to predict condom use. And then in South Africa, there was an intervention. It was a gender-focused intervention that included substance use, gender-based violence, sexual risk, and linkage to HIV care for those living with HIV. And women who received the intervention were less likely to report frequent heavy drinking, intimate uh, partner violence, and also reported more protected condom use. Uh, for a project uh, impact in the United States, MSM who used crystal meth were enrolled in, a, in an RCT that used behavioral activation, which is an evidence-based approach for depression that involves identifying and participating in pleasurable goal-directed activities. And here they found that men who were um, uh, on this arm of the study reported fewer condomless uh, anal sex acts with men who were HIV infected who had or who had unknown uh, status. Um, there were also more continuous days abstaining from crystal meth use. I wanted to just highlight one other thing, which was um, an incredible absence of uh, research, new research addressing the issues of transgender people. We had the one study that looked at drug-drug uh, interactions between PrEP and feminizing gender affirmation hormone therapy, which again had unknown clinical significance. But in general, transgender populations were not mentioned in most populations um, that were not trans-specific or related to key populations. And I also wanted to add that there were no oral presentations that were specific to transgender men. So as I wrap up, I wanted just to talk about some important takeaways from the conference. So, you know, it's not just about ART. Um, and it's also not just about meeting 1990-90 goals. We need a holistic approach to improve care, including access to substance use treatment and behavioral health services to improve long-term health outcomes. So undetectable equals untransmissible, but we still need to scale up everywhere. Perhaps scale up is an important part of HIV elimination strategies. But programs need to take into account specific needs of the populations served. And again, some populations just aren't being served. Um, for example, youth and people of trans experience. So programs have to be designed that tailor to these populations. And um, we can use syndemic therapy to improve health outcomes by intervening on co-occurring issues and make a huge impact on prevention and treatment. But this is going to require rethinking how we provide care. And this is going to take a lot of political will. Rapid start is an effective way of engaging people in care and improving outcomes. And lastly, key population-led interventions are crucial to engaging populations who've been left out of the HIV response. Lastly, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I also want to do a special shout out to Lorraine <laughs> from IAS who really helped us with all of our technical issues. Thank you, Lorraine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Emily Bass, Track D Rapporteur, a writer and social justice activist with a strong dedication to LGBT and women's health agendas. Emily Bass has spent more than 20 years working on HIV and AIDS in America and East and Southern Africa. She is Director of Strategy and Content for AVAC, and her work centers on powerful activist coalitions that use data to drive strategies for accountability and change. Please welcome Emily.
Good afternoon. I am beyond honored to be here on behalf of the Track D Rapporteur team, Yvette Raphael, Felicita Hickwim, Rob Newells, Sandra Mon, presenting the dynamic essential work of human rights defenders, activists, researchers, comrades and colleagues who presented this week. The time is too short to capture everything in, of importance, so this Wakandan proverb is a placeholder for David Malbranch's plenary yesterday, which should be required viewing for every single citizen working on the AIDS response. If this week can be summed up by any slogan, it is this one, from HIV Justice Worldwide, which works against HIV criminalization. Human rights plus science equals HIV justice. This report back and our daily summaries capture a range of presentations and developments that harness rigorous scientific evidence in the service of informing programs and identifying policies that uphold human rights and therefore are good for public health and those that cause harm. It is no mistake that I am highlighting the slogan. The work against HIV criminalization reached a pinnacle this week in a way that is no accident, but rather the result of a tireless effort by a range of bold and determined rights defenders around the world, including Plenary Speaker Robert Suttle, responding to what this map shows as a global epidemic of HIV-specific or general laws used to prosecute people with HIV for alleged HIV non-disclosure, potential or perceived exposure, or non-intentional transmission. The laws are everywhere. Enforcement is on the rise. In the period during which information for this map was collected, nine jurisdictions applied their HIV-specific criminal laws for the first time. The majority of reported cases occurred in the U.S. and then Russia. Sorry, Belarus and then Russia. On Wednesday, oh, how do you go back? On Wednesday, a critical tool for fighting criminalization was released, the expert consensus statement on the science of HIV in the context of criminal law, which had as its lead author the inimitable Linda Gale Becker, president of IAS. The statement reviewed the science behind U equals U and stated in the clearest possible terms that these laws are bad for people, bad for the epidemic, bad for public health. This This meeting provided much information also on the challenges to achieving and maintaining virologic suppression, particularly among the same criminalized and or marginalized populations who are often in the crosshairs of human rights violations. A presentation in the, in the Tuesday session noted here found that the majority of a cohort of Canadian women with multiple vulnerabilities, including homelessness and drug use, would not meet the legal test of undetectable viral load for more than six months proposed as an Ontario 2017 prosecutorial guidance dictating no prosecution of people who meet those criteria. So while U equals U is powerful and empowering, and this is what we heard throughout the meeting, is a tool for fighting back against criminalization, this conference held a range of reminders that supporting people's engagement in care requires looking at multiple layers of barriers and facilitators, one example being a socio-environmental model used in South Africa, described yesterday. If these layers aren't addressed, then suppression is difficult and criminalization is still not acceptable. Let us all remember David Malibranch's call to watch our language and to note that HIV, the HIV treatments cascade is not a correctional facility and that people living with HIV are engaged, not retained in care. We heard in this session and in the Beyond Blame present pre-conference that while U equals U provides a powerful undergirding to arguments against criminalization, this is not about placing responsibility on individuals to keep HIV to themselves. Here I'm paraphrasing Chris Byer. It is about the government's responsibility to ensure access to health services and to protect the rights of key populations, including migrants, a theme that emerged from the conference, as I will discuss in a moment. And that we have, have a better picture than ever after this week about practical approaches to providing these services, as well as the policy adjustments needed. For example, this session, Occupy the Edemic, Epidemic, provided a range of actionable evidence about how housing and food insecurity drive risk and poor outcomes for people living with HIV. A co-chair's choice presentation highlighted improved outcomes around virologic suppression for people who use drugs and are living with HIV when methadone maintenance therapy and HIV treatment are provided as integrated services. This slide shows the probability of injection risk by stable and unstable housing. An Whoa, that happened. Where are we going? Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
Where are we going? Anybody got any ideas? Okay. All right. Um, so this slide is talking is one example of the research that, that we saw, and we saw a range of things um, that linked different um, structural issues, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, to inability to suppress viral load or to risk behaviors. So these, these are things that really have to be incorporated if we're going to do true combination prevention and comprehensive care. The evidence is here, human rights plus science equals HIV justice. We heard this week, too, in several sessions about developing coalitions across criminalizations of sexuality, drug use, and provision of sexual and reproductive health services, where the most pernicious example, let's see, yes, side, highlighted by the plenary speaker Peter Piot, and in a session that ended just earlier today, is the Mexico City policy, otherwise known as the global gag rule. Dr. Piot said we need to think about quality as well as quantity of funding, and it's been vastly expanded under the administration of the country I'm from. This is a slide from today's session giving the Planned Parenthood global advocacy agenda. Apologies for losing the formatting here a bit. And it is also the key to note some takeaways from the session that while it is difficult to measure the comprehensive direct impact of the global gag rule because of lack of data on foreign NGO subrecipients and funding who likely represent a much larger number than prime recipients, there is no doubt that it is causing harm. One speaker said, we will not know the extent of the harm until it is too late. Planned Parenthood said that a significant impact we are seeing is the stigma the policy operationalizes. The stigma itself is a harm of the policy as it affects sexual health. In today's session and in a Tuesday satellite, we heard about the chilling effect that the rule has in many settings. People are afraid to meet, to speak, to mobilize. It is weakening reproductive health justice coalitions. This is not a time for inaction, for fear, for passive reporting. So allow me to pause here and take my own stand against this politics of fear, this ugliness being perpetrated by my country, this ill-advised conflation of human beings' right to choose when and how they become parents and have pleasurable sex. As Dazon Dixon Diallo said in the Realizing Rights session, these choices are essential, and we cannot demonize the word choice by associating with a single word service, abortion, which I'm not afraid to say. This is about everybody's right to choose how they control their bodies. Sadly, there are other laws and legal frameworks that impede public health where they claim to do the opposite. Yesterday, a pair of presentations from Canada and France looked at the impact of end-demand laws that support the Nordic model of seeking to eradicate sex work, criminalizing the purchase of sex, and targeting third parties and clients. The Canadian study, whose conclusions are shown here, was a longitudinal project that looked at access to services among sex workers pre- and post-law reform that included end-demand statutes. Access to health services and sex work services, such as drop-in centers and supports, decreased after passage of the law. In France, a, in France, a mixed method qualitative quantitative approach found that enactment of end-demand laws put sex workers at greater risk and led to, I'm quoting here, an acute increase in sex workers' socioeconomic vulnerability. Elena, Elena Argento, the presenter of the Canadian study, summarized the implications of this research well, saying, it is critical that legal interventions and policies follow evidence that end-demand cr criminalization exacerbates barriers to health services. You know what I'm going to say next. Science plus human rights equals HIV justice. Okay? I'm just going to add a quote here from the TV session that you might have been in um, from Dr. Paul Farmer, who said, we need to trap ourselves into decency through legislation and policy change. Nope. Okay, the French study also linked end-demand laws to increasing mobility of sex workers as livelihoods become unstable, people move. Indeed, the criminalization of irregular migration is a determinant of HIV risk, and this conference has done more than anything I can remember to put this on the map. Sessions like this one highlighted the ways that discriminatory laws, as well as the fear of raids and immigration-related prosecution keep people away from health services. We heard from Global Fund Executive Director Peter Sands about how migrants fall through the cracks, 
Funding fails to reach them because they are not recognized. The conference makes it clear that lists of key affected populations and criminalized groups need now to include undocumented migrants. This slide has some of the steps to take, and the sessions here conveyed a broader message, which is that the use of criminal sanctions to address the irregular movement of people across borders is a choice, it is not inevitable, and that it is essential to put a firewall between migration enforcement and health provision. The issue of migration ties closely to the closing of civil society space. In a Wednesday symposium session on this topic, a colleague from Hungary highlighted the way that migration and xenophobia is being used as an excuse to clamp down on civil society. This is a Hungarian train station with an ad campaign directed against George Soros, who is accused of bringing migrants to flood the Christian country. At this session that I'm speaking about, activists from around the world described a strikingly similar set of tactics being used by governments. Requirement of NGO re registration, disclosure of foreign funds, deregistration of potent groups. So the HIV movement must move forward making these connections and fighting back. There was evidence, a lot here, of how to fight and win, including the use of street lawyers and paralegals described in the Wednesday Justice on the Margin session, and community embedded litigation strategies that start with formative work in the community, as described by Hashwell Esterhuizen, Tashwell Esterhuizen from the Southern African Litigation Center in the Thursday Creating Danger session. Human rights plus science equals HIV justice. That's not what I want you to be seeing, but we're going to go with it, okay, guys? What, with what resources? That is the question, and it is a key question that got addressed in a range of sessions here. This is a human rights cascade um, that was presented by Rolf Jorgens in a session that you can see the number of. Um, and what's showing you is Global Fund grants, the number of total submitted, the number with a human rights analysis, the number um, that had human rights programs, and then the number that had any traceable budget. And what you see is the cascade going down and down. Now, the Global Fund is showing a lot of leadership and trying to incentivize work but we have to acknowledge that this essential work remains underfunded, and that was a theme throughout these sessions, even as civil society space is closing, even as the evidence is supporting that human rights protections are good public health policy. Let us hope that this meeting, meeting helps move this forward. Another thing raised in this meeting and relevant regionally is tracking the impact of transition, global fund transition out of some countries. Global fund has been a, le a source of leverage and political capital um, and when it leaves, we must ensure that civil society does not lose the ground that it has. There are powerful examples of civil society mobilizing to keep services, such as in Macedonia, and provide them themselves. Another, another critical takeaway raised by civil society yesterday and throughout the meeting is assure, ensuring that PEPFAR's long-awaited key population fund happens, and then it does what we know works, which is moving money to civil society in countries who know what their communities need, and that this is matched by other funding for key populations. On the subject of human rights defenders mobilizing to take care of themselves, Track D would be remiss if it did not highlight the vibrant activism here seeking to move AIDS 2020 out of Trump's America to a place that is safe, that allows this to be a powerful space for mobilizing, restoring ourselves, moving forward, that it must be. No one understood the need for this organizing more than Prudence Mabele, who was memorialized in a powerful session. And to close, I want to borrow from my track D repertoir, friend, ninja, role model, and the, one of the co-chairs of this session, Yvette Raphael, who asked people in Prue's session to turn to each other and say, she multiplies. I want to thank IAS for this opportunity and my team and everybody here who is defending human rights around the world and ask you to finish with me by turning to the person next to you and saying, she multiplies. She multiplies. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I, I did want to take just a moment to thank someone else that we haven't thanked much this week, and it's our sign language interpreters here who have powered through.
if these professionals can uh, do interpretation for a boy from New Jersey, they can do interpretation for anyone. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to next introduce our track E rapporteur, James Hargreaves. James is professor of epidemiology and evaluation at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His areas of research focus include evaluation methodology, including impact and process evaluation design, and mixed methods research. HIV prevention with a focus on behavioral and structural interventions, and HIV epidemiology with a focus on routine and program data, social determinants, and HIV epidemic dynamics among high-risk populations. Welcome, James. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm reporting on Track E, which is uh, the implementation science track. Uh, I want to say, say an enormous thank you to my team. We called ourselves the Implementers. We have these very nice purple shirts, uh, and they're listed on the slide. Um, so the Track E, the context um, when we arrived um, for the, all this implementation science, the world is changing. Um, we arrive at a time when the bits of globalization are often going backwards. Uh, there are worries about funding changes and funding falls and lack of political will. But we're also reminded that we're in the time of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Lancet Commission reminded us that now is the time to double down on the many, many successes we've had in the HIV response, to bring those to global health more broadly, and to bring our expertise in having generated an intersexual response to uh, other areas of global health. UNA has reminded us that we are in the middle of a prevention crisis. And if one thing comes out of this meeting, hopefully it will be breaking down the barrier to correcting that. We're in a time of universal health care, and we have to square that also with our desire to focus on and appropriately put resources towards vulnerable populations. Our toolbox is strong. Uh, we're, many countries are rolling out dolutegravir-containing regimens. PrEP implementation is happening. Uh, the Partner 2 study showed incredible evidence that U certainly does equal U. And we were surrounded everywhere by cascades, um, partly because we arrived with big news on the horizon about the, the task trials. So implementation science felt like a good place to be. What were we looking for in Track E? In, in Track E, we recognize that these efficacious, important tools exist, and it's the job of programs to get these to the people who need them. That's why we uh, take so much care over the cascades, the treatment and prevention cascade. And implementation science studies uh, try to go from the existing implementation stra stra strategies that we have to improved implementation strategies. These programs are, uh, need to think about targeting. They need to think about differentiated service, components different to different platforms. They may be more or less vertical or horizontal and bring in other sectors, and they need to be costed and financed. And they also need data systems to support delivery. So we were looking for rigorous, pragmatic evaluations of delivery strategies, process evaluations that told us about their accessibility, acceptability, and those sorts of things. We were looking for costing and cost effectiveness data, and for examples of service delivery data being used to track the epidemic and drive the response. We were interested in systematic reviews of such studies and policy research, particularly that relevant to implementation and financing. We also wanted to keep an eye on what was missing. In combination and differentiated prevention programming, we heard from Nduko Colonzo and the Kenyan experience. She talked about the prevention options that we've had, both biomedical and behavioral, and she talked about uh, data-driven prevention um, to, and the targeting across geographies. We heard in several sessions from the Linkages Project and also from my colleague Paranita in Kenya uh, using uh, data-driven programming for prevention. At several sessions, we heard Ambassador Burks um, talk about promising signs of impact of the DREAMS program. And generally, it feels like DREAMS is getting going. I think we need to be, remain cautious about over-interpreting these data, which relate to prevalent infections in young women attending ANC services rather than new infections. From Nora Rosenberg, we heard about youth-friendly clinics and how these led to, um, young people to pick up more HIV tests and condoms. We heard about microfinance uh, participants being in, uh, brought into a gender empowerment program, which reduced uh, intimate partner violence uh, by about one-third. And we heard about a cash and care program evaluated in South Africa using a pragmatic randomized controlled trial, and that it was shown to impact on the structural drivers of adolescent HIV, including parenting skills. We heard lots about PrEP implementation. Um, the Prevenir study has shown us that there's no new infections uh, in daily or on-demand PrEP in that setting. But across the world, there's much more variable demand and uptake of PrEP. Um, and it's not really yet clear what the optimal strategies for PrEP implementation will be. Jared Baton suggested we need better messaging um, to uh, increase demand for PrEP. Um, and we, we need to address risk perception and stigma. The Access Project in South Africa sought to identify factors influencing in initiation of PrEP. 
and found um, self-identified risk as being one aspect that's important. And the PREA study reminded us that we need also to integrate PrEP uh, with antenatal clinic services. Um, it offered uh, PrEP to pregnant and postpartum women of whom around 20% initiated. We also uh, need to learn more about how to uh, understand and support continuation on PrEP. Just this morning, Sinead delaney Morat we presented the Empower Project, which had a, an impressive uh, gender screening, uh, gender-based violence screening program along with community dialogues and then a, um, clubs uh, to support continuation on PrEP. And unfortunately, this wasn't successful despite very high levels of initiation. And in Kenya, it was also true that women, who initiated on, women and men who initiated on PrEP um, had dropped off quite quickly over the cascade. Uh, it's very, we need to be careful how we overinterpret this data with PrEP because people cycle in and out of periods when they leave it, but we still need the best strategies. We heard about these universal test treat uh, st studies. We, we heard last year about the TASP trial and how that was not successful in reducing HIV incidence in KwaZulu-Natal. We heard about the MaxArt trial, which was a complex step wedge trial, which appeared to show that early initiation of ART was, not, was associated with similar levels of, uh, or better levels of retention. But we also heard about the SEARCH trial, which uh, was a, a huge endeavor uh, implementing a community health approach with a patient-centered multi-disease model they managed to reduce HIV mortality and TB and HIV uh, incidence and control hypertension, but did not see any, definition, uh, any difference between the arms in cumulative HIV incidence. Their explanation at the moment is that there was a very active control arm, but I think much more will need to be done to work out what's going on. In contrast, the Yahtzee uh, cluster randomized trial in Botswana, which includes around 10% of the whole population of the country, also implemented a complex intervention to get people tested and then initiated on ART. And they were successful in reducing community HIV incidence in a cohort. Uh, the question now is whether this uh, package of interventions will be rolled out or which aspects of it will be deemed to be rolled out at scale. And I think we all look forward to hearing the results of the HPTN 071 pop art trial next year. We also heard a lot about the implementation of testing programs. Testing programs can reach men, they just don't do it most effectively through clinics. In Malawi, we saw weekend male targeted testing as a way of getting men in. And we heard lots about uh, um, other approaches to reach men, such as secondary distribution of HIV self-tests given to uh, women in antenatal clinics to take home. And this trial, secondary analysis of a trial showed that that also increased in male levels of partner testing. Self-testing, as in the last few conferences, was a big issue. These are the results from the Malawi STAR study, which showed that uh, community-based uh, distribution of these tests uh, re increased the level of testing as a whole and population-level population ART initiation rates. And people who self-test and find out they are a positive, this study in South Africa, nested within the POPART study, showed that that did not act as a barrier to their linkage to care, although those who uh, did found that did a self-test unsupervised were the slowest to link. We also heard a lot about index and network-based testing that to come back on the agenda as an implementation strategy. I think implementation studies need to keep a handle on whether or not these are having um, unintended effects, but there did seem to be a lot of innovative models being delivered and including, increasingly, uh, including in Ukraine, where an optimized case finding model, which leveraged social networks and incentivized, seemed to be having, reaching populations that otherwise weren't testing. And we were reminded in several places that testing isn't only about finding cases of HIV. It's also about an important point at which to talk about prevention. And then just this morning, uh, we had a particularly good session that followed on from the, the stigma, uh, from the plenary yesterday. Um, in his power, powerful address, David Malabranche um, identified for us that we really need to think harder about research that looks at clinic level barriers rather than person level barriers to retention and linkage in care. An impressive study from Vancouver showed that methadone maintenance therapy, people who get access to methadone maintenance therapy who are addressing drugs, spend longer virally suppressed than those who do not. In Zambia this morning, we found out, we heard about urban adherence clubs, which reduce late drug pickups. This was a nice um, pragmatic randomized trial. And in Tanzania, another trial showed that ART community delivery is non-inferior to picking up from clinics in Tanzania. We heard about a range of other approaches to um, linkage and retention, including appointment spacing, community IoT groups, and this seems like a very active area uh, of great implementation research. There wasn't so much cost-effectiveness uh, presented. Andrew Phillips uh, showed that it, it's probably a cost-effective intervention to, to spend more than the standard levels of testing uh, if they can reach men uh, below 500 US dollars per case found. Matt Quaife showed that in the future when we get multi-purpose prevention technologies um, 
for uh, prevention of pregnancy and HIV. Um, these will likely be cost-effective uh, in areas where HIV incidence remains high, such as in South Africa, where his study was based. And we heard time and time again about the, most, the importance of those core aspects in the, core, the prevention toolbox, condoms, medical male circumcision, and outreach. These are relatively cheap interventions, although we still need to do much more implementation research to make sure we know how to deliver them so they're most effective and ensure that they're funded at scale. Under financing, we continue to make great strides in univer towards universal access to ART, but high prices remain a problem and will continue to do so in the future because of issues to do with patent and intellectual property. Um, this slide in, in a session showed the huge gap between the costs uh, to the NHS of one particular drug and the cost of production, and we need to continue to innovate in ways of bringing down prices. I'll just leave there for a second. And then we need to consider also um, the sustainability of, um, there has been much discussion around the conference of domestic, the need for greater amounts of domestic financing. And what we can't let happen is that happen and overtake a, a conversation about continued donor funding. Um, this was a, a, a slide from a presentation that was talking about transition periods and technical support during the period of transition of funding. Um, and an important new thing, I think, is because of the growing recognition of community approaches and their central uh, importance in the response to HIV, we need to ensure that these financing discussions take account of those. And there was some quite nice data presented on the relative additional cost of these that can't get lost in budgets. And finally, on data systems, um, there was a lot in this conference about the, the, the idea of data-driven programming. And we want to get towards strengthened routine data systems that can help providers deliver both prevention and treatment. But our general impression that there's still a long way to go towards robust facility or program label data that can be used confidently. Um, you can see why this is important because key metrics, for example, at the macro level like the fears, they're so important in galvanizing and understanding where we currently are. And that kind of energy can be used in programs. There were sessions on the treatment cascade everywhere, but also a few sessions on the prevention cascade. And the, while there remains debate about this as a framework, there seems huge support for the idea of data-driven prevention. One session that showed the value of good routine data was a, a session from uh, data from England, where CD4 back calculations showed that the decline in incident infections was quite different from that in diagnoses, and this changed, a, changed interpretation about what was needed to go forward in prevention planning in England. And we heard in many, many places about dashboards. This is an example from Ambassador Burks' slides uh, around monitoring viral suppression rates across clinics. I saw similar examples in relation to delivery of testing and in relation to delivery of prevention programs. And we have a range of new technologies which we need to harness uh, and support people to use so that they continue to make data uh, useful for programs. And so the, the conclusions of the implementers were that this implementation science is an exciting one and it's evolving. We saw good examples of pragmatic impact evaluations around the conference and good process and formative evaluations describing programs well and asking the right questions. We found relatively few costing studies and we didn't see almost any systematic reviews of implementation studies and that's an important area we'd like to see more of. We'd also like to see more prevention implementation science um, in the next conference and more evidence relating to new financing models. But there were key emerging lessons around implementation this week. Peers and communities are critical for prevention and treatment implementation across almost all settings. Targeting and differentiation models, that we're seeing a huge amount of innovation in that space, and that idea of differentiation is as important for prevention as it is for treatment. Intersectoral collaboration is critical and it's feasible and can be achieved in programmatic timescales, and that relates both to delivery of programs and to their financing. And finally, the call for data-driven prevention and treatment is rising, but we're going to have to take seriously investing in data systems to support this. Many thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Raminta Stukita, Community and Leadership Rapporteur. Raminta has been working in promoting transformation of policies and strengthening civil society in the field of HIV, drug policy, and access to medicines for the last 15 years. She works with regional HIV and drug policy networks and initiatives across Europe. In the last few years, she focused on increased awareness and solutions for greater sustainability of HIV and TB responses and more effective donor transmission. Raminta, please. Good afternoon. And 
as you can hear from the sounds on this side, uh, it's not only me who is coming here to report to you what happened with the community and leadership program, it's the whole team. And I must say we had very good, excellent and diverse team. Thank you for your work. And even though we were excellent, it is so hard to to do justice to so many great sessions and discussions that we had in the leadership and community program, in sessions and in events and in the corridors. So we chose a couple of highlights for you. One big theme that was coming out here was the narrative that we are close to ending AIDS has been challenged. We heard eloquently yesterday Peter Piot voicing what IES and Lancet Commission said. We are not on track to end the HIV pandemic, and the discourse on ending AIDS has bred a dangerous complacency. The 2030 agenda and SDGs are relevant and enable universal health coverage to address intersectionalities, social determinants, and vulnerability to HIV. It helps to address multiple needs and multiple issues that are faced by our communities and people in HIV. But we should not lose what made the AIDS movement unique. Governments should not use the 2030 agenda to whitewash AIDS. The political environment, this is what we talked a lot in multiple sessions. People talked that there is emergence of political environment and forces that are anti-woman, anti-migrant, anti not anti-racist, racist, homophobic, anti-key populations, anti-choice. And this othering of this, these forces is at the core of their ideology. It's not because of their ignorance. It's, this is what they're basing their ideologies on. We heard already from other reporters about shrinking space for civil society. That is reality in, of our times across the world. In the rich countries and countries may be poorer. In the US, Russia, Hungary, Kenya, and Venezuela, and so on. We heard also that it is done through different means, through foreign agent laws in Russia, through more sensitive measures even in the cyber information campaigns and infiltration in our movements. And to respond to that political environment, to that shrinking space, we heard several emerging experiences how to resist and what new tactics to overcome the political environment. But there were too few, I think, discussions and knowledge what to do about it. And while we need more action, we know that human programming and advocacy is underfunded. They belong to what one person called to the exclusive 1% club. So only 1% of AIDS funding is going for human rights. And that should change. Donors should invest more in advocacy and should start also funding in different ways in reaction to the political environment, meaning also fund emergency support. We heard also from other reporters several times that there were messages that no 2020 conference in Trump's America. And I don't need to explain why these messages were coming out. The positive element of all this new environment and bigger pressure to us is something that Sean Mellers from International HIV AIDS Alliance Forum framed very nicely. When they try to silence us because our voices have traveled and amplified our spaces, we know we are doing something right. And that's part of the message. This is why they're afraid of us. The third big topic was how we will fund our response, who will fund it, and how we will sustain our response and make it better 
not only where we are now, but reach uh, the targets. UNIS reported that projected funding is not sufficient to even sustain the current levels of response, not even like to scale up. We heard multiple times that there are middle income countries and they face major challenge as donors retreat and transit out. And at the same time, in middle income countries, this is where most of people in HIV live. This is also where most of people who use drugs live and many of us also live. There is increasing expectation that the solution is coming from domestic funding. But some were asking whether it's indeed the solution or whether it is illusion. And whether it's illusion also when we heard that we need to invest more into prevention, but it is still unclear who will fund that. And many voices and many sessions concluded that when it comes to key populations and communities, it's very unlikely that services for them, that empowerment of them will come from domestic sources. But the answer is still unclear. So what will happen with those services, with the communities? Important part of the discussion about financing was coming from the concept and discussion treats the world and let's work united across diseases for quality and affordable treatment for all. And this conversation is very important because we want to have more affordable tools in order to deliver it to all people who need it and everywhere in every part of the world, including in middle income countries, in high income countries and low income countries. The voices from the global village were saying that pharma, and meaning also with, with the high prices, uh, is still acting as an organized crime. We heard also from the researcher from the UK, Andrew Hill, who was calculating how much actually it costs to produce, manufacture medications and add the profit and show the difference between the cost and the price that we are charged. He was saying that a due high profit could be enough to cover the whole global funding gap, not only for AIDS, but also for TB and hepatitis. And we know that conversations about access to medicines are also being tried to be brought to high level meeting on TB. And there were concerns that this might be a missed chance if we don't do better, including with the calls towards the Netherlands, towards other countries to include strong language on access to medicines in the new de upcoming declaration. We heard about reinforced and expanded gag rule in the United States and that the new research showing that it will impact hundreds of NGOs that receive USAID funding, including those who are uh, partnering with PEPFAR. The true implications are yet to be seen. The government of the Netherlands is hosting this conference here in Amsterdam and took that with a promise and urgency of what's happening in Eastern Europe and Central Asia and with the promise to address that. Why that is important? Because if globally we are doing quite well, not well enough, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the epidemic is still growing in incidence, in mortality, in prevalence. Actually, 95 of new HIV infections last year were among key populations and among their sexual partners, 95%. And also less than 40% of people living with HIV receive antiretroviral treatment. This is improvement, but this is very much uh, in, with a major gap of what needs to be happening. We heard also that HIV is heavily interlinked with other epidemics with tuberculosis, with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, hepatitis C, drug use and drug dependence. 
and heard that different countries in the region are taking different paths with Russia and Ukraine sometimes put in, in one of the contrasts of the paths that they are taking. There was a pre-conference which was hosted by the Netherlands, WHO and UNAIDS, which hosted the ministerial policy dialogue on HIV and related comorbidities, where ministers and very few but still some civil society groups could discuss where the countries are on the way towards ending the HIV epidemic. There were good practices that were shared, some progress about domestic investments increase, about creating efficiencies like reducing first line uh, ARV price. But there was recognition that it is only working progress when it comes to serving and investing in communities and key populations. And that more regional dialogue and learning from each other needed. In the corridors, we heard also of the, and we are part of the campaign, initiated and led by Eurasian key populations, community groups, civil society networks, which was called Chase the Virus, Not People. And that campaign was asking to invest in health, communities, and not criminalize them. And when we speak about that will take longer if you applaud. But I understand that you also need some, some movement. Um, one of the populations that we are failing, and it is only one of the populations that we are failing, is we are failing people who use drugs. We failed on the targets that were put for 2015. Instead of 50% reduction of new cases, we had 33% increase in new HIV cases globally. And that discuss multiple discussions that we had also emphasized that research shows that it is the only key population where there is strong evidence that life expectancy has declined over the last years. There was criticism in the discussions and voices from communities and civil society and others who were discussing the responses uh, to HIV among people who use drugs, that there is too much reliance on that biotechnological, uh, biotechnological solutions can be found and will be the solution, with too little focus on the things that work. And might be the bit of old school, but this is what community needs, uh, like literacy, like peer and peer approaches, and serve, being served not necessarily in clinics, but where they live. Drug control is taking a toll of lives. We heard from multiple countries numbers that are staggering. We heard from the Philippines that during the war on drugs, more than 12,000 people were killed. And 2 million people are under threat because they are registered and they don't know what will happen to them. At the same time, investment is very limited in the services that are needed. It's only 13% of the funding needed outside high-income countries, so in middle-income countries and low-income countries, 13% of funding that is needed, that is invested now. And if to look at the drug control budgets, which are high, it would take just less than 8% of drug control budgets to fund the harm reduction gap fully. And lastly, at this conference, we heard a lot of messages about solidarity, inclusion, and the dialogue. We saw and heard more people from communities, we saw more presence from communities, we saw more youth and some new voices, which is great for refreshing our movement. We saw also intergenerational challenges to hear each other and to work together. Twitter nation with the old school writing nation. 
A lot of messages of inclusion were there, but some still left behind, like migrants. We also had a sense that at the conference, sometimes there was an echo chamber talking and working in silos. We saw at the conference great leadership of several ministers of health, of parliamentarians, UNITE, who are working on HIV, TB, and hepatitis. But we heard also calls that in the future, if we need solutions and we want to find the solutions, we need also to involve other parts of government, including ministers of justice and finance. We need more solidarity within AIDS and across other social movements. And yes, HIV is still political. We, we all from all paths, researchers, academia, health professionals, communities, civil societies, donors, and others, we should reclaim it. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Raminta. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Desio Macheso, Global Village and Youth Program Rapporteur. Desio has seven years experience in adolescent and youth SRHR and HIV AIDS programming in which he has designed and executed innovative projects. He currently works for Palladium in the USAID funded health policy project as senior program associate. He provides technical support to government and partners at national and district level to effectively implement and monitor implementation of youth-friendly health services strategy and family planning in Malawi. Thank you, Desio. Thank you. Um, this is the last one. Uh, on the summary, Gobo Village, and we also covered on youth. So it's outside, where there's a lot of exhibition and exciting things for young people. So um, again, equally my team, um, uh, credit to them, uh, very youth people, uh, younger than me, actually. Uh, but they did incredible work of uh, going into all the sessions and uh, actually making sure that we cover uh, a lot for what we can provide as recommendations as we go out to our respective countries. So my presentation uh, this afternoon, this evening, uh, is in three sections. Uh, we just talk about the content, uh, the substantive material that has been presented in the sessions, which you can take away. Um, uh, then also discuss the challenges and limitations of um, um, pretty much the process of uh, consolidating this information in terms of getting it from the presenters and probably how it was delivered. And I'll uh, we'll try to make a few recommendations in terms of how uh, that can be improved uh, next time. So I think the key takeaway message is that I think uh, based on the theme, uh, breaking barriers and bridging bridges, uh, evidence has been solicited uh, from the overwhelming number of uh, presentations that we had uh, this week. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, there's evidence that is showing what's working and probably what's not working, and probably some of the information evidence in terms of what should be uh, something that is of, uh, of concern for all of us in terms of programming. Um, I start with, in relation to evidence being presented with uh, precision programming, uh, others would call it uh, evidence-based programming, uh, or use of evidence in terms of how we structure programs, and not just only stretching our programs, but also identifying the right people uh, to be saved. Uh, and, uh, there are a lot of uh, presentations, uh, exhibitions, um, and demonstrations in terms of showing uh, how evidence has been uh, solicited. Like, for instance, there was uh, one presentation, one of the sessions, uh, which a Choice um, and a few other related organizations actually did uh, kind of like a, an assessment uh, of implementation of comprehensive sexuality education and making recommendations uh, to decision makers in their respective countries in terms of how it should be delivered. Because um, when you're in Africa and um, we see like the we assume that public comprehensive sexual education is actually better implemented uh, in the West, 
and probably uh, this um, presentation actually illustrated that actually it's not actually uh, young people here are also facing some of the stigma they are religious forces uh, in terms of also kind of like putting barriers in terms of access to information and sexuality so it's it's something that probably we'll be looking back and uh, uh, people can look at in terms of scaling up in Europe and probably in, in African settings and probably because uh, for the countries in the southern and eastern Africa they do also like have the ESA commitment uh, which one of the objectives is actually to enhance implementation of comp sexuality education. So this, we believe, uh, it's one of the uh, it, um, uh, activities that, or evidence that was presented for us to move forward. Um, Dreams, uh, Dreams project, uh, which is implemented, supported by PEPFA, uh, and, and implemented in a number of countries in Africa, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Mozambique. Uh, there's got also a lot of lessons that probably I think as uh, programmers we can take lessons from in terms of what is being implemented. Uh, in terms of what can be adopted, uh, which I'll eventually explain later on, it's not probably maybe 100% uh, complete adoption in just uh, copy and paste, but probably in our context we can look at now based also on evidence we have in our communities, how much adaptation we can take from such uh, interventions. Um, HIV financing, uh, I'm financing HIV and AIDS. Uh, this has been a theme that has actually been repeatedly coming out in most of the sessions, and uh, including one, I think, which was uh, hosted by uh, the Global Fund booth, and where actually there was a mention of uh, um, kind of a gap of uh, funding uh, for the Global Fund for it just to get on track. They're talking about between 14 and 18 billion US dollars um, as a gap just for Global Fund to get on track. Not scaling up, but just to get on track. So this is a serious concern, um, which probably I think should be worrying. Uh, having said that, probably there are, in some of these discussions, there is some hope, because uh, a lot of countries are demonstrating that it's possible on their own to stand and finance these programs. Uh, there was a presentation uh, which was made by the National Executive Director for the uh, Kenya AIDS Council, uh, we showed how Kenya is also a kind of actually trying or actually making strides in terms of uh, uh, financing HIV interventions. So it's something um, with the cuts in funding from the donors, we know that actually uh, countries are owning up and actually uh, taking responsibility to uh, implement the, uh, to continue with the uh, interventions in HIV. So it's something that probably we can learn of. But caution was mentioned also in one of the sessions that if we leave it to government actually to own it and uh, implement and, and finance HIV AIDS, for the key populations that have actually been marginalized by law in those countries, and probably leaving uh, government to own it actually risks actually also making losing grain, uh, gains that have been made in implementing for the key populations because government on its own will not be willing to finance programs for um, the key populations uh, for those countries that actually have got prohibitive laws. So it's also something that has to be balanced uh, in terms of uh, actually the waste, um, encouraging sustainable financing, but also on the other hand, making sure that no one's left behind in the spirit of the SDGs. Uh, there was also, in terms of opportunities uh, in, in, in financing HIV, one of the cases was mentioned in terms of actually being innovative in how we finance uh, these programs. There was, uh, uh, for instance, an example given in, in Uganda where they are what they are calling community health entrepreneurs. So it's kind of a similar card with uh, what people would call a community volunteers. You know, uh, maybe in Malawi there would be something you know, similar, kind of like the uh, health surveillance assistance. But in, in this model, what they're trying to do is not just leaving those volunteers, as Professor Paul Farmer mentioned, um, I think they're committing their time. So probably they have to be um, paid for that. So we cannot rely on volunteers in responding to HIV AIDS. Probably we need to see how we can uh, actually use the model that is being uh, traded out in Uganda of um, uh, community health entrepreneurs. Inclusive programming. Um, this comes uh, relevant to this session, um, probably when you're talking also about stigma. So stigma has been repeated almost every day when you've got a session uh, coming up as one of the barriers, which is still uh, one of the challenges that we need to deal with. And uh, uh, in response to that, we've seen uh, some illustrations of some interventions uh, or different groups on their own uh, taking tough stand and actually um, championing change and uh, uh, defying all odds that are actually preventing them to, to implement uh, programs like in, in illustrating that they've been taking approach not 
a shift from the medical approach where uh, HIV is just taking like giving them drugs, but also um, looking at uh, dealing with the uh, stigma that is associating uh, with it and also doing uh, with uh, quality of life because just giving them treatment without other um, supporting mechanisms. There was a mention about nutrition, there was talk about, um, I think, TB earlier on the discussion. Probably there has to be a proper package rather than just limiting on provision of uh, uh, prevention. And we've seen some of those uh, examples uh, like this one, women uh, with voices not an HIV diagnosis. This was one of the sessions which was uh, actually highlighting how the key population and even women are participating in key decision, core decisions that are made in, in programming for, for, for them actually to have um, their issues that affect them uh, addressed. Uh, there was also um, uh, an illustration from uh, a case in Tanzania where um, stigma is actually being dealt with, where young people have been built with the capacity to advocate with service providers and sometimes it's young people that are training healthcare providers uh, in, in changing or dealing or changing their attitude of dealing with young people and one of the areas they are looking at is actually uh, supporting the health facilities to put up uh, code of conduct so that healthcare providers are always reminded in terms of uh, what are the ethical obligations um, they should um, adhere to. Differentiated care models of prevention and uh, care, uh, it came out again. Uh, it also relates to um, the stigma and a little bit upwards in terms of uh, um, being inclusive. Uh, so again, as we talk about differentiated care models, because you know, sex workers have got their own needs and different uh, conditions, and we also know that um, uh, men who sleep with men have got also different conditions, uh, men injecting drugs, all these have to be factored in terms of programming. We don't have to assume because we are, for instance, targeting young people uh, between 10 and 24, then therefore it's in a homogeneous uh, population. That has to be also factored in. Um, but in terms of uh, differentiated care models, it also has to be the right balance because um, as mentioned earlier by uh, James, uh, there is also a requirement for us, or actually another um, approach of doing it, actually a combination uh, of interventions like, you know, um, integrating uh, the services. Now, there is always one of the things probably we should, and that's to be, I think, uh, based on context and eventually engaging young people at that level. There is a concern where, in some cases, young people want, I mean, services within closed space where actually adults cannot see them. But in other cases, sometimes young people want open space because uh, they don't want people to conclude that they've gone into that room because they want to access um, uh, STI treatment, for instance. So there has to be the right balance in terms of uh, dealing with young people and um, uh, uh, making sure that probably there is a separation in, depending on circumstances where we differentiate services and where we can combine. Um, the Director for National AIDS uh, Council for Kenya also won't, but even though uh, because of the evolution in terms of the response in care and prevention, there's been kind of loss of focus or actual emphasis on provision of the basic commodity, a condom. So uh, there is a sorry, recommendation that probably we should not forget the basics and which have been proven effective. Meaningful youth participation, it's one of the uh, also things that actually came out a lot, even in the projects that are implemented by uh, huge organizations, even in the projects that are actually implemented by the youth themselves. Um, the DREAMS uh, provided evidence in terms of how they're working with young people meaningfully. Um, uh, EGPAF uh, made a lot of um, uh, cases uh, where they are involved, uh, involving young people in decision making, designing research tools for young people to, to get involved meaningfully in the whole process of implementing and responding to, to the issues that are affecting them. Challenges um, that we observed um, now after consolidating all this information, what we wanted to communicate is that I think in most of the uh, uh, presentations that were made at the Global Village, uh, we observed that um, there was little link in terms of reported activities versus the results that are being claimed um, to, to, to be achieved. Like for instance, um, a whole session would be about organizations. It's kind of like marketing. Uh, marketing interventions or organizations. So it's like, oh, what do we do? We do meetings, blah, and then after we do them three times a week, and it ends there, like, so 
because the objective was to reduce HIV, but in the activity it's not being shown how that is, the activity is linking to reduction in terms of uh, uh, HIV infections. But the assumption still comes when they're coming here to present their interventions. It's kind of like showing, uh, because we implemented ABCD, therefore we are contributing to reduction of HIV. So it's one of the things that actually um, I think was also mentioned by, uh, by uh, pre uh, the, pre the earlier presenters in terms of uh, having lack of rigorous uh, uh, monitoring of these interventions that we're implementing. We also observed that there was like weak interdisciplinary conversation on topics. Um, uh, in courts, I'd call them incomplete panels. Like for instance, uh, with the DREAM initiative, as, as holistic as it is with the layers that I mentioned, um, it, it gave us an insight in terms of you could be responding to HIV but not dealing with the issues, for instance, of sexual violence. So um, um, in one of the sessions it was presented that actually, like in Malawi and Mozambique, I think it was one of those two or three countries that have got actually um, an increase or actually sustain uh, high levels of sexual violence or coercion uh, for adolescent girls, which eventually if left out and if you just focus on HIV interventions, you could actually be missing it because if there is, uh, and the levels of sexual violence at this time were like as uh, were high, like you're talking about 30 or 40 percent. Um, so if you could be, I mean, if you're implementing on HIV uh, uh, prevention, but probably not dealing with issues of sexual violence. Uh, you're already missing uh, one of the strongest link, which I think in this panel probably could have invited how law enforcement, because of have got laws that are pro prohibiting um, uh, these practices, how then are, are these partners engaged to also sit in the panels like to discuss how they're dealing with uh, uh, the problem. Dreams, uh, uh, we also talked about no little conversation in terms of uh, discussing about the massive big projects that are implemented at the high level and versus the grassroots. We're also thinking with the reduction in uh, financing nature beds, how are, uh, how effective or in terms of our research, how are we measuring which one is more effective so that we invest more? Like, I'll just give an example. Uh, we've got this massive organization versus a, a grassroots organization. So, uh, VIV, uh, VIIV uh, providing uh, one of the presentation, how uh, evidence providing uh, how there is that shift uh, in terms of uh, reduction in terms of financing, big organizations, while there's a decline, big organizations are actually increasing uh, their income in that area. And small organizations are the one which are the grassroots, are the ones that are losing the aid. So it's also kind of looking at effectiveness and probably investing uh, on the right. Um, and um, lastly, uh, on the challenges that we faced, uh, cancellation of sessions, that side, it was terrible. And sometimes we'd go in the sessions, we'd only find that there are five people. And with an organization that it's just implementing activities, but it's not giving you evidence. What the expectation was, they'll conduct like a workshop session to get input in terms of how they can shape their programs. So with five people, it was still not possible for them. So in terms of programming, I think next, like next time, I think probably uh, it's something that we could look at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desio, and thank you to all of our repertoires.